My name's Clive Lovelace, and um, after being a bit of a hippie in the uh, 60s, I, um, and I used to write, uh, but before that I'd written articles on property investment, but then thought it was all corrupt. But as I typed my articles, I used to um, look down on the floor and there were uh, little rugs, abstract rugs. And uh, they rather took me, you know, and I went and bought a book for 12 shillings and sixpence called Oriental Carpets in Colour. Anyway, um, and strangely, then I met this guy called David Black, the late David Black, he's died now. And uh, we, he had just started a little shop in a little gallery, a one-room gallery in uh, um, Holland Park. And we started working together and um, we used to do carpentry and paint houses in the morning and sell peacock feathers and then um, you know go and, if we had any money buy a rug and uh, but we became quite well known and we worked uh, from about 1969 uh, to 1984 and uh, I mean even David uh, David Attenborough so David Attenborough and the BBC came and filmed in our gallery at Which that in Holland Park it was just down in Clarendon Cross, it was called, which was a village in the 60s, but now it's much more posh. And uh, anyway, this went on. And then, um, I don't know, we, we split up after 16 years, totally amicably. And I carried on with selling, uh, you know, wool and silk textiles too. So I worked in wool and silk. But I had met a, a young um, uh, American dealer from California who I still know called Andres Moraga and uh, he was already buying uh, raffia Cuba textiles from Africa from Central Africa and uh, it all started um, with my Tootsie baskets when uh, on a trip to uh, I was, often went to Maastricht to the art fair and uh, Andres um, said, look, I'll be in Brussels and you can stop off in Brussels to have a coffee. And we had a coffee. And then he said he was going to introduce me to a dealer who, and I went to this dealer, a very famous dealer called Pierre Luce. And uh, suddenly there were, there were actually four or five Tootsie baskets. And this big one, I remember that one and that one and that one and maybe this one. And... Um, I was fascinated because uh, there was fibre weaving uh, and instead of flat weave rugs and textiles, they became sculptures, you know? And I didn't really know anything about them, but I just loved the, the design and uh, the feel. So I brought them back home. I, di I didn't sell them. And uh, so I carried on with my rugs and textiles at home. But unfortunately, I, we divorced in 94. Uh, and I had to sell a lot of things, uh, including my Tootsie Baskets. And um, anyway, uh, so the years went on. But around 1995, um, and we'll see a picture later, someone tipped me off to go to the Royal Academy because there was a, um, an exhibition called Africa, the Art of a Continent. And blow me down, for the first time ever, there were a group beautifully photographed of five Tootsie baskets, not unlike mine. And this was the first time they'd been given some dignity, you know? And uh, anyway, things then moved on. And um, around, uh, then I started, um, uh, got back on my feet and managed to buy this flat here around 1998. And I kept on, um, pestering to get my Tootsie baskets back from this, uh, this dealer who had kept them. Anyway, one morning he rang me up and said, do you want to buy the baskets? I said, yeah, yeah, please. And uh, how much do you want? He said, give me 200 pounds profit and you can have them. So I read out a check and just the five I told you about came back on this coffer. And it was, as I said, rather like a family coming home, you know? But that's what stimulated me to go to Belgium, to Brussels a lot, because of course the Tutsis had been, uh, you know, much looked after by them there. But and an interesting, uh, the Tutsi baskets were um, only made by the, by often the Tutsi women 
and because the Tutsis were very rich, they, they owned the cattle and everything, rather like a European, um, you know, a, a French woman or an English woman sewing things in her spare time with silk. Uh, Tutsi women uh, would make these baskets, but f maybe for a jewel or something very, you know, s very special. And uh, the bigger ones for, for grain and that sort of thing. So that was, that was interesting. And it was in 2001, when I was in America, I went to um, the Fogg Art Museum. It's near it's Harvard University. And they had this fabulous exhibition called Marking Places. Can I show the picture? And there, can you see, is an image of a Tutsi woman and she has her maids and above her are Tutsi baskets. And this photograph is from 1905. And even that Tutsi basket on the front. And shall I read the, the bit? And this is where, uh, to show, explain how prestigious they, want, they were. And that's why I want to kind of read it from this uh, piece. While objects help define places by establishing visible boundaries, they also do so by distinguishing a previously demarcated place. For example, the display of prestige objects such as the Tutsi basketry containers from Burundi in a noble woman's home, the cover and fig three, confers status on a place. These baskets used to hold jewellery and currency replicated the shapes of buildings in the region, woven structures with conical roofs suggesting a connection between the value of their contents and the wealth of the individuals contained within the architecture. When such refined objects were displayed prominently, they confirmed the identity of the home as socially elite. The Tutsi baskets in this sense played a role similar to that of prestige objects in other cultures, including our own. Anyway, so that set me on the, the road and over the years, I'm very proud to say I've made uh, three uh, international collections. Uh, one in Canada to a, to a collector who I used to sell uh, Uzbek uh, uh, Ikats and silk Susanis too, but his wife who came here one day said, oh, those are rather interesting, yeah, you know, aren't they? And he went, mm, yeah, anyway, they started a collection of Tutsi baskets and also uh, the biggest probably is in Sweden, uh, in Switzerland, sorry, in, um, in Zurich and um, also to an American collector and I'm very proud to say uh, that um, there was an exhibition uh, at the Washington Textile Museum in uh, 2011 called Weaving Abstraction. And it was mainly about uh, Cuba textiles and the woven art of Central Africa. But at the end, um, they had um, many of my Tutsi baskets uh, I had sold. I hope you can see a few of them. And um, I was terribly proud. Look, here again is the picture that was used in 1900, you know, that was used at the Harvard University show and, um, and another group of Tootsie baskets. So some of these uh, baskets, they have uh, different techniques in the way they were made. Um, for instance, the most typical weave is what's coiled, co called coiled and woven. And this is a, a very nice, uh, you know, gentle example from the early 20th century. Uh, but they can become incredibly fine like this. This is coiled and woven, but it is so fine and so beautifully made that I can turn it upside down and the lid stays on. And if one opens it, it's like silk, silk work inside. This is a fantastic, um, uh, a piece. I, I love it as to a certain number of collectors but I don't want to sell it and I call this design a stepped wing design. It feels like that. But then uh, also quite even rarer are these very delicate. These are called plain weave 
all right? A very simple plane weave. However, they have a supplementary weft patterning, if you can see, which is very subtle and they're very light, but it can easily be broken. I mean, it's amazing how some of these have survived. And um, for, uh, for instance, this very tall one, if you go to Bright the Brighton Museum, there's one very like this, and people think, oh, that must be new. No, it was given to the museum in 1921 because the British were fighting the Germans in the Great War and um, the Germans were, um, had taken over, were governing uh, Tanzania and Rwanda. And then, of course, they got knocked out and the British uh, moved in. So some of the earliest and best baskets I've ever found actually come from England or Germany rather than Belgium. And um, however, this is also rather beautiful, it's coiled and woven, but very unusual, and, and it's told, uh, it's said that the, um, the baskets with decoration on the lid uh, are from the Tutsi people of Burundi. Most of the baskets are from Rwanda, but these are from Burundi. And uh, so I think that gives you a general idea of some of the techniques and uh, the finesse and the uh, larger one. I've had a really big, you know, big storage basket too I sold to Switzerland. So that's them.